How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for my weekly overviews of these books from Marvel Comics. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we have one epic collection. We don't really have a lot of books, but keep in mind, there's also a couple of masterworks that came out today. And there's also the two Omnis, Thor Omnibus Volume 4, the classic Mighty Thor, and the Incredible Hulk Omnibus by Peter David Volume 5, which I've done overviews on the channel if you want to check them out. Uh, but what we're looking at here are the trade paperbacks that come out every week from Marvel. We have one epic collection. We have this really awesome, I love the concept behind these books. Uh, we have the latest Captain Marvel, I believe this is the penultimate volume, and we have the latest Spider-Man. Now when I am going to be talking about Spider-Man, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you, I have to talk about some spoilers about this and then what's happened previously. So if you don't want to know anything about Dark Web, uh, just go on to the next part of the video which is captain marvel in the description of the video i always put timestamps. and as always i like to remind people at this time to smash that like button please so what we're going to start off here is a little bit different we're going to go ahead and show off the spines first because i usually do that about halfway through the video but with only four books i figured eh, let's just go ahead and do it now and as promised here are all the spines of the books that are coming out this week most of them look about the same, but then there's this epic collection right here. There we go. All right, let's go ahead and start the overviews with Amazing Spider-Man by Zeb Wells, Volume 4, Dark Web. So here we go. Now, if you own the Dark Web trade paperback, you already have all the stuff that's collected in here. I'll just go ahead and tell you that because... Dark Web also collects, of course, issues of Venom, the Miss Marvel one-shot, and the X-Men miniseries. This doesn't. This just collects the Amazing Spider-Man 15 through 18, Dark Web number one, and Dark Web finale number one. But it also collects material from Free Comic Book Day. This kind of gives you a setup as to what this is about. Uh, but again, I'm going to go into some spoilers territory here. Mainly talking about the character of Ben Riley and what happened recently, and the character of Madeline Pryor and what happened recently with her in the Krakoa era. All right, so all you brave souls or people that just don't care about spoilers, let's go ahead and dive deep into this. This almost feels like a follow up to the Inferno book. I've done an overview of the Dark Web uh, thick trade. I didn't go too much into spoilers. I, I did have to talk about Ben and Madeline though. To kind of give people an idea of why this is happening. But the reason I say this feels like a follow-up to Inferno. And, and I mean the original X-Men Inferno. Not Dante's Inferno. Or the Hickman Inferno. Is because Madeline Pryor is now still ruler of Limbo. And of course she's going by the name the Goblin Queen. So her being a clone of Jean Grey has kind of made her snap for a while. She returned the pages of Hellions. That's when she came back. She had a little bit of a thing with Havoc, and that was written by Zeb Wells. So, of course, he wanted to bring her into his Spider-Man run. And what better way to do it than to team up with the arch-nemesis Chasm? So, of course, he wasn't always known as Chasm, but this is Ben Riley. At the end of the Spider-Man Beyond book... He decided that he was going to become a villain, mainly because Peter Parker refuses to share his memories with him. Uh, somebody has been messing with his memories. I'm not going to go, going to go into detail as to exactly what happened, but he doesn't remember the time that he was Peter Parker. He just remembers a lot of the times that he was Ben Riley. So he has this internal hate for Peter because he feels like Peter has robbed him of his true life. But not just Peter, other characters too, as you'll see through here. This is the one shot that kicks it all off. And this is pretty much both Madeline Pryor and Ben Riley choosing to unleash hell on at least New York City. Mainly because they're clones and they feel like they've been shucked to the side. So now he goes by the name Chasm and her, of course, the Goblin Queen. So... During this time, we also see that Norman, as a matter of fact, Peter is working for Norman. Uh, Norman's kind of turned towards the side of the angels because of everything that's happened recently, especially with his son towards the end of the Nick Spencer era of Spider-Man. You can find out for yourself exactly what I mean and what ha ends up happening to Harry. Now, 
Madeline and Ben Riley decide, okay, we're going to need some help. So let's just grab this guy, Eddie Brock, from his ongoing series in the middle of nowhere and put him into this particular crossover. So they do grab Venom, so he's back. Uh, now, the issues of Venom that kind of expand on the story are not collected in here. They can be found in Dark Web or in the Venom by Ron V and Al Ewing book. Uh, Hallow Hallow's Eve is also part of the story, and she's a newer character. She's a character that can pretty much put a mask on and become that particular monster. Whether she puts a werewolf mask on, a Frankenstein mask on, she becomes an, an and just gets those powers. She would have had a blast in the 80s when there were so many masks based on trademark characters. And then you had that t-shirt that just showed the character. I remember like my brother was walking around. It's like Fortress Maximus. And I was like, that's not even a Fortress Maximus costume. It's just a stupid plastic mask. And you're shirt which is like made out of trash bag material it just says fortress maximus anyway i've always been snooty about my halloween costume when i was a kid so i made my own all right so now ben riley confronts norman osborne saying hey look i may not be able to remember everything about peter parker he stole my memories but i remember you and now of course you know, norman is no longer going as the green goblin he is this golden goblin here and he has a golden glider so he's sort of a good guy. Then we jump into the big fight between Venom and Spider-Man. Now, like I said, there are some things that are not collected in here that will probably make sense as to like how Venom is pretty much just taken out of the story. Miss Marvel will jump in and out. You don't really see the turn of the Goblin Queen whenever she decides, okay, wait, we've gone too far. Let's just take a step back here, Ben. You don't really see that because that happens in the pages of the Dark Web X-Men story. So if you want to see all of that, check out the, the big trade paperback that will uh, has all those issues. So she does end up turning on Ben and she teams up with Spider-Man. This is, uh, what is this guy's name? It's Parker backwards. Uh, Rec Rec Rap? Rec Rap, I think is his name. Uh, yeah, so he teams up. He's like a demonic being that teams up with Spider-Man. As dorky as that is, I kind of dug it. Okay. Actually, you know, this story really didn't bug me. It's weird that we're having this and the crossing because I know how people feel about the crossing in the or felt about it in the past. And I feel like that's the same kind of reaction people are having with this crossover here. And maybe it's because I'm not really that invested in Spider-Man or, you know, or I kind of look at Spider-Man as like, okay, I'll just wait for the whole ride to be over. Like when I was reading Dan Slott's era of Spider-Man, I stopped reading it in singles and I started reading them in trades and eventually I moved up to oversized hardcovers. So I would read them in chunks and to me it felt like a better reading experience. You know, people would get pissed off at a certain issue and for me I was like, oh, well, let's just see what ends up happening. So I kind of feel like Zeb Boyle's run is like that because I read the first trade and I really enjoyed the first trade. The uh, second one was okay and then the third and fourth, <laughs> this one here, the, the third just, I didn't dig at all. The fourth one I was like, ah, uh, he's having fun with the characters. Um, so I was okay with this one, honestly. It wasn't a horrible crossover. I've seen a lot worse. And it didn't really last that long. I kind of was thinking this might have been a big, big crossover. Especially when you're dealing with Spider-Man and X-Men. So I don't know if they'll make an oversized hardcover of this. Or Dark Web, rather. Um, but, yeah. It's up in the air. But that's all I will say. You can find out exactly what ends up happening at the end. Whether New York City gets restored. Uh, the status quo for both Madeline Pryor and the character of Chasm does change a little bit. And... Ed McGinnis supplies, by the way, the artwork for the ongoing issues. And you have Adam Kubert doing the Dark Web one-shots. So I thought that was cool. All the way in the back, you're going to have some of the variants. And I say some because sometimes on the opposite page of the standard edition cover are the other variants. And a lot of these are homage variants. There's character design variants right here by Ed McGinnis. This book has 165 pages and retails for $19.99. Captain Marvel, Volume 9, Revenge of the Brood, Part 1. And I believe Kelly Thompson will be leaving the book as of issue 50. So the next trade paperback will be the last one. And I say that with a sad tone in my voice because I have enjoyed the hell out of this run. 
I mean, there were a lot of ups and, you know, a couple of downs, but that's everybody's run after writing a character for 50 issues. You're not going to have a winner every time. And it feels like to me for the first time that it's a natural progression of the character of Carol to become Captain Marvel. It didn't feel like it was just kind of shoehorned in to a particular story. I wasn't the biggest fan of Kelly Thompson. I'm sorry, uh, Kelly Sue the Conics run or any kind of run that followed afterwards in, in Zeb Wells writing her as Captain Marvel for the first time. It just, I don't know, it never really clicked with me. And it's not like I fear change. We fear change from Wayne's World. No, no, it's not, it's not like that. It's more of like, well, that kind of came out of nowhere and you know comics do that from time to time and then later on it takes the right or proper writer to come in and explain things as a character would naturally progress so to me that's what kelly thompson's run did on captain marvel i really liked her take i love the respect that she showed a lot of the past characters that would come in like her supporting cast not just old school characters that she's been friends with but also newer friends and, you know, the additions of characters that have come in that are related to her. Yeah, I don't know. It, just, it was a very charming book with a lot of action-packed stories. So this particular run, it's going to be a little hard to talk about because we are talking about the final, I guess, the last story arc that she will be writing. But it starts off with in a, the uh, Judgment Day crossover where not just her but her sister and her cat are being judged. And you can find out why they're being judged by reading Judgment Day. And then we kick off the big story arc, The Return of the Brood, or Revenge of the Brood. The Brood doesn't just return, they get revenge, of course. Uh, she gets a message from Binary. And, of course, Binary is separated from Carol. She's a, her own entity now. That was in a story that came previously to this. This is uh, her and Rhodey hanging out together. And then she gets another distress call from somebody from her past and that is of course rogue so rogue's like i need help i think we made a mistake and she's wearing her old school outfit right there her 90s outfit but i think it, to a lot of people because of the animated show that's the one so the x-men team up with captain marvel and they're like hey we need to take a ship but she's not just with the x-men she's taking spider woman with her and hazmat i love the fact that they're throwing them in there so they go together on an adventure to go and rescue rogue and it feels like it feels like a story that probably would have fit perfectly in the mr and mrs x series if unfortunately that series didn't get canceled again but in rogue series oh man i missed that series that was such a good series and I feel like this particular story was probably the idea or the script for that series. And because the series ended up getting canceled because, well, Jonathan Hickman said, Hey, you know what? How's the powers of X? Everything else? Out the window. She got to write it here. So that's nice. It's a, it's a, I think to me, it's a proper send off to the characters that she wrote. Not just Captain Marvel, but also Gambit and Rogue. Uh, but yes, the brood do come back in a very unique way. Uh, this collects issues 42 to 46 of Captain Marvel, the 2019 series. No word yet if there's going to be a second omnibus. That first one uh, just came or comes out later this month. Yes, this one here, the one that's hiding the final page so I could show off some of the variant covers that are collected in thumbnail size. This is the one, uh, this is Kelly Thompson Volume 1. This only collects up to issue 26, I believe. 25. But no word yet if there's going to be a second volume. I think they're just waiting to see how well the pre-orders of this have been, and then they'll probably announce it. Knock on wood. I hope so. Because I'd hate for a run to be left as a volume one, but, you know, it's happened in the past. Look at you, Miss Marvel, and a couple of others. And then some more variant covers in the back. Uh, this book has 112 pages and retails for $15.99. X-Men Legends. Past Meets Future. Now, it's something they've done is decided to take out the volume numbers from these. Uh, this really would be X-Men Legends Volume 3, but they just decided to call it Past Meets Future. I love this cover. I really thought whenever I saw the solicits for it, I thought it was Daniel Warren Johnson, but that's actually a Carrie Andrews cover right there. Whoa, what's going on here? All right, so what is the idea behind X-Men Legends? X-Men Legends pretty much brings back a lot of the classic writers, a lot of the people that worked on these past stories of X-Men. And kind of says, hey, you know what? Write a story set in the past, but it cannot impact the future. 
So that's a task that is very difficult to do because if you're always setting up a story in the past, you can, you know, the, the cheap thing to do is always like, and then they forgot their mighty misadventures they had in 1969. Their minds were clean and they can't remember anything that happened. You know, th some, some writers have to come up with a unique way of why they can't remember meeting characters in the past. So that's what I like about this the most is trying to find out exactly, you know, how a writer would pretty much wipe the slate clean saying, okay, this adventure happened, but it doesn't affect the future, uh, mainly with like the character, a long shot, which we'll get to in a little bit. So the first two issues is that of Roy Thomas meeting up with Dave Watcher. And they put together a story about Wolverine immediately after issue 181 going on another mission. So Department H comes and gets him and they're like, we need you to team up and go and do something. Like, it doesn't matter what this other secret mission is. The MacGuffin is ridiculous or whatever. But the important thing is that in this particular mission, he gets to team up with Jack of Diamonds. And there's a couple of other characters that show up through here. You probably saw this right here. So how in the world can Wolverine meet Havoc and Polaris and Angel and Iceman and them not remember him by the time we get the giant size X-Men number one? Well, I will say that the twist and turns in this one where, yeah, I, I kind of like what Roy Thomas did here. There's a couple of other characters that he brought back in here too that... I haven't, because of the Marvel epic line, I was like, who's going to remember these characters? The second two issues are written by Anna Sinti, and of course, she's bringing in her character of Longshot back immediately after issue number six. This time around, it's Mojo, Mo, Uncanny Omar talk pretty one day, Mojo pulling the strings and pretty much capturing the characters of Kitty Pride or Shadowcat at the time, Lockheed and Wolverine to go and destroy Longshot and his army, his army of rebels that are rebelling in Mojoverse. So this is another one of those stories. Well, how could they have met in the past if by the time Longshot shows up in annual number 10, they don't recognize him? All right. So the next story arc, which is one of my favorites right here. This really feels like Wills Portacio was like, this is the story I always intended for Bishop. And it's a damn shame I never got to finish it. Yeah, not because he got fired or anything. He's the one that decided to leave. But I'm sure in, you know, the bottom of his subconscious when writing stories, like he was still thinking about Bishop because he's such a cool character. He was a character created by Jim Lee and Wills Portacio. But Wills Portacio, I feel like, well, not only was the artist, but also did some of the co-plotting there. So this takes place before Uncanny X-Men 281. Well, the flashback does. This, I assume, takes place right around X-Men number 8. Right after Bishop gets to meet the X-Men. And it is all drawn by Wills Portacio. He co-plots the story. And it's a really cool flashback of Bishop with Malcolm and Randall. And, you know, other characters make an appearance through here. And it's just their adventures. And man, did I want this story to continue. I so would have followed the adventures of Bishop and the XSE. Yes, I wanted a couple of other characters to show up. Just because, well, post Wills Portacio. Like Shard, for example. And there were a couple of other members of the XSE that I really enjoyed during the Howard Mackey era of X-Factor. But there's Fitzroy, the man responsible for everything but then again, responsible for Bishop making it to the past. So this is a really interesting story. I really love the concept of this. I really liked returning writers coming back, whether it's Fabian Nicieza or Chris Claremont. But having Roy Thomas, I mean, Roy Thomas is no stranger to writing X-Men. But he really didn't get to write much Wolverine. So it was really cool to see him write this particular story. And Ascenti's always, always welcome to write, in my book, you know, characters like Longshot and the X-Men. I thought... I, I think there could be so much more long shot adventures. And then of course, like I mentioned, the Wills Portacio really makes me think that I think a Bishop series with Wills writing about his past during his time, which we've seen before, right? In miniseries and in ongoing series. I, I think it could work though. Bishop is just such an interesting character, a man that's trapped in the past, destined, you know, to see all these things happen and play out in the future that could or could not exist anymore. Uh, all the way in the back, we have some of the extras, including one by Nico Henriken, who I haven't seen draw in a while, or at least internal comic book artwork. Uh, 136 pages, retailing for $17.99. 
If you have not been checking out this series, do yourself a favor. They're just a lot of fun. The X-Men Legends are just great. There's two volumes, Mutant Mayhem and the very first volume right here, The Missing Links. But this volume, I have to give the Near Mint Condition seal of approval. It was just a lot of fun. And it was great to see some of these writers come back and write some of these characters and take a chance on characters that they never wrote before. So I'm I'm in for more of these and I hope they continue making them. Let me know in the comments down below if you're if you've been enjoying these. And and if there's any way to shoehorn these into an omnibus one day, like a Claremont omnibus with some of his legend stories or or the extreme story that Fabian told. Last but certainly not least, Iron Man Epic Collection. Volume 21, The Crossing. So, I want to just go ahead and say that this is not complete. There will be more story in Volume 22. So, if you're hoping that this wraps up, no, it doesn't. It's been collected before in omnibus format. And I think that's it. Yeah, The Crossing is just one of those stories. I don't think it... Yeah, it never got a trade paperback. Believe me, I, I'm one of the few people that... I actually like the crossing. I know it's weird. Uh, so I looked for trade paperbacks. Here are the main creators behind this. At least list of uh, inkers there. But the writers, Bob Harris, Terry Cavana, Dan Abnett, Andy Lanning, and Ben Rabb. And then Mike Deodato Jr. pretty much coming in strong with the Deodato uh, Studios. So much so that in issue three, uh, 390... They were doing some covers before this, but in 390s when they came in strong. This is after the William Messner Loeb's run on Wonder Woman. That this guy out of Brazil had a very similar style to that of Jim Lee. So, of course, all the editors were after him. They were like, oh, we got to get this guy. All right, so this collects Iron Man 319 to 324, Avengers 390 to 394, Avengers The Crossing, Force Works 16 through 20, and War Machine 20 through 22. It is in proper mapping order. Like I said, I, I enjoy this story, so I, I can tell you right now that this is in the proper mapping order. Now, why is this such a hated book? Uh, that, that might get into some spoiler territories. I will say that a lot of people don't like the treatment of a couple of characters. Not one in particular, of course. One in particular and how the fix came about. But a couple of other characters that just kind of did away with them for absolutely no reason than shock purposes. So it all starts off with this issue of Avengers right here. This is Avengers 390 again, introducing Mike Deodato Jr. in his studio to internal artwork. And there's this young man that came out of nowhere. His name is Tuck. And Tuck is sitting around the Avengers. And this, of course, being the Avengers at the time of Hercules looking like that. Death Cry, Magdalene. And who else? Uh, Quicksilver. And, of course, Morella, the babysitter to Crystal's baby right there, Luna. And Quicksilver's daughter, too. So, he's telling them stories about things that could come to pass. And a lot of them get heartbroken about the things that are going to come to pass. And it's when you find out who he is, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Then we go to Iron Man 319. Now we have Terry Kavana coming in as the new writer on the book. We have a new design. By the way, we're going to get new designs for the costumes in The Crossing, but Iron Man gets his debut of the design of this Iron Man costume in this particular, or the armor in this particular issue. And that actually... A lot of the designs for the costumes came from Joe Madureira, who at the time was just blowing up on X-Men. Like the Scarlet Witch costume, the Black Widow costume. But yes, that Iron Man costume that you see right here. And I think I remember when I was reading this, people hate it. That is a Joe Mad design. Mike Deodato did do some of the designs for some of the Avengers, though. So then the crossing starts. So the crossing is about the story of Yellow Jacket 2, this young lady right here who's trying to travel through time and warn the Avengers of things to come, or she's trying to actually just make it back home. Uh, so she's traveling through different points in the Avengers' lifetime with like, they, she doesn't recognize the costumes, she doesn't write, recognize who this blonde lady is, and she's being attacked. And things are happening to Tony Stark through this, because I guess it's an Iron Man cost or epic collection. There are a couple of new characters that appear, new villains, um, all being... There's a couple of new characters that appear, new villains, all being led by two brothers, Tobias and Malachi. Then we get into the Force Works issues, which, of course, Iron Man was a part of at the time. 
And Moonraker has a little bit of his background story in here. It gets a little bit confusing if you haven't been reading Force Works. And more and more what's happening to Tony is he's having blackouts and he can't remember exactly what's happened. So he kind of blames the drinking. But there are more things that are happening throughout here. Gilgamesh appears out of nowhere. He's an old man and the Avengers are like, wait a minute. How the hell is Gilgamesh an old man? He's an eternal. What's happening? So a lot of changes are coming to the Avengers. A lot of deaths are going to be coming. There's this door that just appeared out of nowhere in the Avengers Mansion. And that door finally cracks open. And out of that door is this little creature named Newt. And I'll show you Newt in a little bit. We have a new character that Tony introduces to Force Works. This is Cybermancer. And the <laughs> Force Works team is like, I don't know whether to trust this woman or not. Rhodey is going through his own changes with War Machine, particularly that armor. He's no longer wearing the War Machine armor, but he's wearing this new technology. It's an alien technology. This is the character of Newt. Now, through these pages, you're going to see some familiar artwork. You're going to see some art by a young Jimmy Chung, or Jim Chung as he goes by these days. These are the two brothers of Malachi and Tobias. They're mysterious brothers that also have come through that door. The Katati Swordsman is back. All these obscure characters keep coming back through here. And the team just feels completely lost and confused. They don't know exactly what's going on. Tony keeps doing things while he's blacking out that he doesn't remember. Like he stopped funding the Avengers. So even Janet Van Dyne is like, why did he do this? Why did he betray me like this? So of course it goes back to the drinking. It could be the drinking that he's doing. What exactly is going on? Lady Mask is back, but it's not the same Lady Mask that we've seen in the past. And then, of course, we get the big conflict. Everybody just kind of turns on Tony, and Tony's like, why is everybody turning against me? One of the reasons a lot of people didn't like this book. Again, there are some puppet masters here that I don't want to reveal. And, and then you have these other stories in here with Moonraker and Spider-Woman that get a little bit confusing because if you haven't been reading Force Works, then you're probably wondering, what the hell's going on? Why is this country disappearing? This is Century. One of the coolest characters from force works that for some reason hasn't made a return there's a brother in arms reunion too through these pages dan amden and andy lanning are some of the writers here but for the most part i feel like it was bob harris and terry cavana that were just writing the main idea and the stories behind the crossing i will say that this particular book though does hardly has any extras the extras are on the opposite page of the um uh, standard covers that's it i mean it ends it ends on a actual comic page there's no no you know uh original artwork or house ads or anything like that all the extras are kind of found on the opposite page like i said of the standard edition cover so i believe that's all i will say about this or the people that haven't read it you know it's it's one of these stories definitely that feels like the uh, Spider-Man clone saga or <laughs> cry for justice that you as a comic book reader, you know, you haven't read, but you've heard so much about her and I almost compared it to trouble, but trouble's not really in continuity it, or, or one more day, things like that stories that you've heard of in the past that you're like, Oh, I don't want to read that crap. It sounds like garbage. I saw a synopsis of it. I always tell people, you know, judge it for yourself, read it for yourself. Cause there might be some things that you enjoy about this or hell this could turn out to be your favorite story maybe i don't know uh this book has 512 pages and it retails for 49 dollars 99 if anything you get some awesome jimmy chung artwork like a young jimmy chung umberto ramos does some of the cover and then you get some mike deorato jr and his studio artwork through these pages but that is the crossing and that as they say is that i'm sorry that's iron man the crossing crossing is an actual event through the avengers but this contains most of it so i guess volume 22 will contain the rest and the time slip issues if you're interested in purchasing any of these books don't forget to check out our sponsor cheapgraphicnovels.com your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50 percent off cover price they have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service check out their bargain deals for up to 90 percent off cover price 
And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these collections. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up, if this is the way you're collecting Iron Man, and do you already have The Crossing? If you've read The Crossing, by the way, let me know what you think of that story. I know I'm one of the... <laughs> I don't, I don't want to say it's my favorite, but I think I'm one of the few people that actually didn't mind as much as others did. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think of that story. If you've read it in omnibus format, if you read it as it was coming out, did it insult you in any way? And you were like, I'm out. No more Iron Man for me. But anyway, I would love to know all those comments down below. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. Ring that bell for notifications. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love. <music>